us and do the things we've discussed ad nauseum, you have an absurdly receptive culture to play with and principle to guide you, but I cannot be with you at every turning. I am not without taxing employment myself, comrade. I have a complex role to play. Act independently. Scatter red herrings. Leave an impression, as you will. Extemporize, embellish ad libitum, but keep eye, ear, heart, and mind on our unprecedented work. We create. We are brothers, artists, and you could not have been better schooled. Each step has been weighed and measured, and you have a comprehensive list. For a few days, scatter sustenance for Melbourne's dark hunters, then get thee to the ragged west. If we remain steadfast, all will play out as planned. Oh, I've killed a man, it said, so it said, so it said. I've killed a man, it said, so it said. Oh, I've killed a man, it said, with a lump of flaming lead, and I'll let him bear the day. Fall off the dresses, Governor! Who the lightest! Soon's that you dare gave you a bloody heart attack! Sorry, Governor. <laughs> oh, sorry, dear. Sorry, Swabbit. It's foul murder in fair Windsor. Foul as it comes. Terror grips the populace. Eh? All the latest news, Governor. And this one has a real stench to it. I thought you should know. Foul murder in Windsor. How foul? Quite foul. And it all looks foul. Thank you, Mr. Harford. I'll bring for the newspaper. Inspiration. It's all part of the offered service, Mum. A woman has been found, dead, buried under the hearthstone, in two. A house in Windsor, buried under the very hearthstone suite. A woman, it's a pawn. A terribly rough business, I like all accounts. Yes. A sizable mob of ghoulish onlookers has gathered at the ghastly scene. Don't say. And ghoulish. Witnesses are sort. As they should be. <gasps> it's going to be the husband or the gentleman friend. Always is. He will turn up drowned or hanged or squashed or turn himself in, commit to drunken decline, sail to Samarkand, <gasps> fall from something excessively Can not actually sail to Samarkand? Oh, but it won't last. These things never do. It'll be flesh and hand. Yes, all oh, this modest but timely flash emerges from a somewhat tiny and neglected pan. Is it out here, sir? Yeah. Oh, for God, I'm on! Oh. Wait, wait, wait! <laughs> Miss Ruby, <laughs> that's right, isn't it? <laughs> Delighted to see you again. Delighted. Uh, did the production meet with your... Oh, well, I'm sorry to hear that. <laughs> but happy, nonetheless. Our chance encounter early. <laughs> Our charming interval tea has proved greatly auspicious today. In fact, a turning point in my affairs, and nothing less than a fair reversal of all recent afflictions. <laughs> my business is concluded to the utmost personal advantage, but I cannot help but feel you be my guardian angel and a lucky charm. It's all thanks to you, Miss Ruby. There was something I felt when I first met, so I hope you will not take it amiss if I ask, if I may call upon you to present my compliments. My time is now my own. I would deem it an honor to transport you, as if by magic, to your next destination. We could even share a can. We have an opportunity here, ladies and gentlemen, to do something unique. Unique not only in our little corner of Australia, but in the vasty worlds of legitimate theatre beyond. I am confident that you will embrace this opportunity with the commitment that befits the true artist. I am confident of considerable public 
public interest in our next production. I'm confident, my friends, that you have all seen the newspapers. Hysteria would not miss the mark yesterday and this morning. Heinous crime, ladies and gentlemen, heinous. In Windsor, I fear, we have few, many wives. Some fell on the stony ground. Even now, this tale exudes something compelling, telling, and contemporary. Contemporary, And we must be, as it were, the, the very abstracts and brief chronicles. <coughs> now, <coughs> this is our challenge. I have a hitherto unseen work of my own called The Dark Lodger. The Dark Lodger will be progressively adapted to reflect the terrible times in which we live. Rampant uncertainty, no half safe, fugitive monster, poor woman, winds of murder, etc., etc. Now there will be work for all, as this press hot tale twists and turns from chase to capture, courts, condemnation, and the scaffold. Our play will be refreshed with the latest and freshest report. Things will change imperceptibly. No. By Godfrey, they will change perceptibly. We shall weave new developments into the very living fabric of our play. The Dark Lodger will become willful murder. Willful murder. A thrilling tale of willful murder. Murder. Mystery and wickedness. Willful murder. Now, Rose will be, will be with you at the earliest opportunity and will change in nature and number as our truth or fiction changes. We must be keen and on our toes in this. Now, last night, as you slept or caroused, Mrs. Dagger and I made advances with our text. Speed is of the essence. Ragham has my type machine and costly carbonated paper. We shall prevail! Under the hearth, the concrete was purchased 
from one John Woods of Windsor, along with a shovel and brush. We could get a shovel and brush and concrete from Mr. Woods of Windsor, and we could put it slap on stage. The word would spread. Yeah, well, it's an interesting idea, Harford. A frisson could be created. I'll give it some thought. Claimed hard on his heels, 
Now, we may bestow credibility on that as we see fit. I'd like to get my hands on the killer's canary in cage. We read of poor Emily's mysterious, missing, and flagrantly suspicious husband calling himself um, Alfred Williams, selling the bird and bars to a fellow by the name of um, something or other, and speaking emotionally of its merits. Now, how much does this painful man want for these things? Graham has gone to talk. Ah, the net is closing. Oh. Foreign links, witnesses, a German named Hirschfeld sailed from London on the Kaiser Wilhelm II with a couple calling themselves Alfred and Emily Williams. Ah, Williams again. She was pleasant enough. He was an absolute blighter, crafty, untrustworthy troublemaker. Ooh. Apparently, our maniac apparently has boasted he would write a history of his life that would shake the world. Perhaps it would. Hmm. Now, the contents of poor Emily Williams' stomach has been sent to a government pathologist by the name of C.R. Blackett. For the nonce, box office is brisk. Acting coroner Dr. J. E. Neal opens his inquest tomorrow, and we open hard on his heels. Acting coroner. Yeah, yeah. You know, I like that. Acting coroner. But I still need a name for my policeman. There is no doubt in my mind, Trowbridge, that this Williams bird is our man. As guilty a comb as I have seen. Into the bargain, he's quite barmy, of course. All my constabulary instincts 
R. A. Tingle. He may call himself Williams or Baron Swanson, if you please, but our boys took the wily swine alive, and he shall surely hang for his sins. Pax Britannica. But well, I'll tell you now, Trowbridge, I have never encountered such gossip and rampant speculation. It's rampant. There is more to this than a single bestial crime in Windsor. This nasty business is death, Strawbridge. As sure as you're standing there. And that, of course, makes me look like a complete idiot with no actual Trowbridge standing there. I mean, who wrote this rubbish? Who is Trowbridge? It's McFadden, isn't it? Where is Mr. McFadden? Are we not to be honoured today? Please help him wrangle with the corpse. We cannot have entrails like that. Vile desert. What the deuce was I thinking? Oh, absolutely brilliant. God, I put me in the quad, in the quad, in the quad. They put me in the quad, damn their eyes and blast their souls. Oh, they put me in the quad, cursing all the works of God. Damn their eyes. Blast their souls to hell! I come, mother, for you, for every cursed one of you. I come in your nightmares. That was good. No, I liked that. Oh, it's bad for those oh, who die. Sorry, dear. Nothing, just muttering darkly, Alfred. Oh, I know, I know. Ha! New production and all that, eh? Alfred, we should send back the sheep. My sheep? Mm-hmm. Live sheep do not redeem the already disappointing desert thing. They are fine They sheep. are untrained and provoke unwanted mirth. Fine, nonetheless. That may be so, Alfred, but they are sheep. They get in the way and they make noise and they are incontinent. <coughs> they cost rather a lot to hire. And they don't smell, mm -hmm. don't care what anyone says. Virtually brainless, of course. No, I am resolved. Send the beasts away. Well, what if the desert wastes? A song. Someone can sing a song out in the desert, something satirical, droll, perhaps. Miss Rogers can dance in the traditional Irish style, if nothing else. And our Mr. McFadden can sing a cheeky song. I'll put Cotter's Low on it. Oh, we could paste in a stirring and patriotic rendition instead of all that twaddle with simpleton sharers. You used to like all that twaddle. <clears throat> Low comedy, Catherine, can be useful. At other times, a patriotic rendition. Well, perhaps in a few days you can get rid of the deserts altogether as more information accrues from real life. Real life? <laughs> We've had one of those. <laughs> no, we didn't. You imagined that. Now, chin up. I'm cautiously optimistic that Wilful Murder will enjoy a healthy season. Oh, you're a cracker, Kate. Just rest before me, just Oh, well, I have barely a thing to do. Well, I must go to my doom shortly, so show a little bit of respect and oust the sheep at the earliest opportunity. I'll mention it to Ragnar. It's so very bad, Kate. Not at all. Willful murder comes on a case. Hmm? The accounts are encouraging. Hmm? The word is out. You have caught the mood of the times, Alfred. Clever man. Congratulations. You're right. Now, where's thingy and thingy? Spit upon your conventions, your institutions, your worthless, flabby lies. See, no repentance of me, I'll have none of it. The game is up, you feeble dancers and drones, because the game is fixed. Your morals are laughed to scorn. Your gods, great and small, drag the whimpering through filth. Damn your eyes, and plague take you. Be silent, Williams! 
blasphemous dogma against your own unseen, your wives, your children, your goods and movables all. Now, with nothing but contempt, I have done with you. Give ear, draw near, give ear, draw near. In the name of our sovereign lady, the queen, her Britannic majesty, Victoria, all true and good people of this state of Victoria, with fair reason to attend this place of coronial inquiry, must straightly be seated and steadfast in consideration of the issues here divulged. Good God, Captain, does Neil really go on like this? A certain dramatic license. I trust Mr. Cottesloe has not bathed his muse and spiritual figures. Uh, not as far as that. This textual fiasco bears no resemblance to any coroner's court I've heard of or imagined. I don't think we can get away with this. I say, Mrs. Duncan, is that, um, is that the killer's very burden cage? It is a burden cage. It's not the burden cage. It's just a hint of deception, dear, uh, an economic necessity. Oh, I had hoped with a sheet gone to have at least covered the cost of the killer's canary. Then you only wanted 50 guineas. Oh, he paid two quid for it. No, so there is one. Graham acquired this similar property for four and six. Good man. Well, I didn't have to do. You know, I, I'm sure it's very like the killer's canary and very distinguishable from that captain's cage. Oh, what horrors has this poor creature seen? Are uh, we finished here then? Uh, what was that? Say again, Harper? Or oh, not. Were you planning a break, Mr. Denver? A break? Yes, why not? Oh, blast! That just reminds me. Look, I've got a, um, an appointment with the uh, journalists. Look, uh, uh, give me 20 minutes and I'll come back. I just want to run through tonight's curtains. I have news! Oh, can it wait, Kate? I'm in a bit of a hurry. Oh, what is it, my sweet? I never see you under natural light. What? Nothing. Just a thought. Well, look, can it wait? Uh, uh, there is a new story. <clears throat> it would seem that our Alfred Williams was well known to many barmaids along the eastern seaboard. Oh, well, must be so many actors. A Miss Kate <laughs> Brownsfell, a not a barmaid, but a gullible rustic girl, was on her way to marry Alfred Williams when she saw his photo in the Really? Mm -hmm. She knew him as Baron Swanson, planned to marry him, saw the likeness, fainted on Flinders Street Station, just down the road. Oh, this is pure gold. There are certain kinds of women, Alfred, greatly intrigued by our homicidal maniac. Really? Mm -hmm. What kinds of women? Mad kinds? Emily Williams, Kate Grounds fell for a start, but it would seem to many of our best the allure of this filthy beast knows no boundaries. Baron Swanson, Alfred Williams, whatever form he cares to take, is a lady-killing lady-killer. Ah, willful murder will uh, beguile the ladies of whom you speak. <laughs> Let us hope so. A lamering swine. Between the slaughtered wife, the several barmaids in Tuesday last, this monument to wickedness has managed to woo and win a nice young girl from Broken Hill. Neil's coronial court is awash with these sorts of women, Alfred. Awash? Mm. Frightening. The jury, having returned the verdict of willful murder against Alfred Williams and otherwise named in fracturing the skull and cutting the throat of said Emily Williams, did feloniously, willfully, and with malice forethought kill and murder the said Emily Williams. The jury, having returned a verdict of guilty, it is my duty to issue a warrant and to commit Alfred Williams to take charge on a trial of a charge of willful murder at the criminal sittings of the Supreme Court. I shall now issue my warrant. Now held hand chains. 
soon, my other self, you will return and hang from the gym. of the tremendous difficulties presented by willful murder, gentlemen. <clears throat> the nation is agog. Uh, the view of marvellous Melbourne is under serious scrutiny. Law and order must be done. The civilization is aghast at this bestial crime. Now, the Alexandra Theatre is the crossroads, the nerve centre, if you will, of a unique artistic social, cultural, and historic experiment in which every man, woman, and child of empire plays a part. Uh, group family bookings will, of course, be attractively priced. Uh, <clears throat> our dear gentlemen, new developments arise in this Windsor horror. Our dear gentlemen, to be presented here, live, on stage, daily, by a fully professional company, now, to help me deal with these difficulties, Willful Murder has acquired, until further notice, that man of the theatre, E. J. Cottesloe. Now, Everlast will help me develop the language of our drama, leaving me free to spend more thought and time on ravishing the beholding eye. <laughs> now, look, chaps, is there anything else I can help you with, hmm? No, 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 absolutely nothing for you on opening night. Later in the run, of course, yes. No, no, time bothered. Soon, yes. Ha, ha, ha. Absolutely, I'll get Rangham, yes? Rangham! Sorry. <clears throat> Last minute change was jumpy. Naturally. I, I was wondering. Do you think Mr. Dampier would be interested in uh, some uncredited assistance I might offer to his script? I jolly well do. Do you drink, Mr. Harker? I still have uh, ambitions as a writer. You do. Everlast will be tickled pink. <laughs> I enjoy a social gathering. <laughs> and I enjoy a merry time with good company. I have made on three continents. Freely. Mr. Dampier will welcome any assistance. He's our crown in times. I've actually made a start. Speculatively. I'll talk to Alfred. So many Alfreds. Mr. Dampier, yours truly, Alfred Williams. Coincidence? Yes, and I will talk to Mr. Dampier about the offer regardless. If he arrives, Ladies and gentlemen, excuse me, ladies. Uh, Mr. Darmody, we will wait for Mr. Dampier a few more moments. Thank you. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I have been captured of journalists. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a, a surprise at the moment, so I just want to run quickly through uh, tonight's curtain calls. Uh, Rangham and Mr. Hartford has have already been hmm, briefed. Now, do pay attention. There will be some, some sort of a striking image at this uh, very juncture, so do pay attention. Right. Now, wings left, if you please. Miss Rogers, Mr. McFadden, Noam and Darmody. Uh, Rogers here, McFadden here, Noam there, and um, uh, Darmody there. They'll thank you very much. Uh, wings right, please. Uh, Mrs. Bootle, if you wouldn't mind, Mr. Ritter, Mr. Short, Mr. Darmody. Uh, there, 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 and there. Right. Okay. Now come on, quickly, quickly, places, please. Thank you, thank you. Right. Begin. Discipline and symmetry. At my signal, Miss Miss Rogers, Mrs. Bootle, I want you in along here. That's right, up a bit here. That's right, yes, yes. Well done, Mrs. Bootle. Thank you very much. Now, the Adam, you're in next. Come on, Riddle. That's right. Same thing as the ladies, but end up there. That's right. Don't bring so grotesquely, Mr. McFadden. Lovely. Okay, now, uh, uh, no, short, in your pop, good, that's it. Now you're beginning to see the picture, yes, right, yes, left, right, good, good. Learn that, fine. Now you must leave room up here for Mrs. Dampier and myself. Mrs. Dampier left, self right. We follow Batson and Darmody on from upstage and we walk down, 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 and we all bow and... 
Mrs. Dagger and I acknowledge our performance, much relative, no doubt. Well there. And then we all go again. And oh, the preacher he did come, he did come, he did come. The preacher he did come with his mum, with his mum. Oh, the preacher he did come with his yap of kingdom come. He can shove that up his bum. Damn your eyes and blast your souls to bloody hell. Yes. He's 
Heinsberg and is a master of it. Several penitentiaries have made him the least penitent. Swindling occupies the most of him. Forgery, deception, robbery, and for our most brilliant of patrons, a welter of avarice liaisons. His names have been linked to the Iberian gold robbery, African mine share shenanigans, I read of the culpability to the disappearance of the Dudley Diamonds. Oh, we've got doubtful barmaids up to our eyeballs, gentlemen, and I'll turn you by then to despair. He contacted Holt's matrimonial agency to find yet another one ahead of his flight to be Roundsfeld. And, for the moment, what? Oh, family. In, in England last year, a wife and four children, they disappeared. The husband, Frederick Bailey Deeming, disappeared as well. An isolated house, a villa. They planned to take up concrete lane last year. Children. Four, all vanished. Four children. I know him. You're an artist, Alfred, with flair. Yeah, the monster is your constant study. Immerse, enjoy. You, you, you misunderstand it. I actually know Frederick Daly. A picture in the paper. A few years. A moustache. Daly. I met him in South Africa. Patrick Bailey Deeming, strutting round the Theatre Royal as if he owned the place. Deeming? You, you know this brutal person? Personally? As sure as I'm standing here. I met him in South Africa. Theatre Royal. I was appearing in Johannesburg. He appeared out of nowhere. Oh, dear boy. We, we went about. Together. Catherine, this, he... A scribe has dubbed him, probably with long distance dubbing equipment, the criminal of the century. Some say he is Jack the Ripper. I appear as Frederick Bailey Deeming, criminal of the century. There must be some sort of mistake. No mistake. Ah, oh, dear boy. Uh, I'm sure I mean, we wouldn't want to make asses. Did you know him well? Not well enough. Quite well. Well, I, I, I knew him well. My dear boy, Frederick Bailey Teeming. Catherine, this, um, this is wondrous strange. This likes me well. This, this knowing is well worth knowing, you know. Can you believe this? Oh, at the very least, an extraordinary coincidence. Wondrous. You're a greater asset than we thought, Mr. Interviews. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I, I had actually planned to read my scene, to, to end no. this special day. Then home. Oh, one moment, one moment. Well, tell us half of what you've brought to Deeming in the desert. Deeming. <gasps> South Africa. Uh, I actually thought of South Africa <laughs> when I wrote these lines. The desert and everything. Now, Mrs. Napier. Could you like that here, please? Oh, Mr. Hoffman, please. Make this brief. Mr. Dampier is already halfway home. Uh, you, you are asleep. Anything to show more fair. Here, at the edge of the world, how easy to slip. You have no idea, have you, dearest? Is this business pleasure? Do you ever wonder why ghosts howl, Miss Mole? Why the dead howl and moan? Why do you think they do that, Rob? No applicable law, rustic theory, or blind guess? No sense, no feeling. Abracadabra, queen and country. The dead moan and wail, Rob, because they see it all. 
they see it all from beyond the grave, and that is everything. They see the living. They're doing this. They know how and why we do it. The faith worse than death. We make them now. The ways of the living make them known. There is no consolation. Man discourages the ghosts. They break. They go mad. You will not know how your brief scene in this dark drama is received. But I thank you for it. You proposed to lure me, receive embraces, lie, lie with me, lie to me, infect me with lies and corrupt me. I will not believe that a girl such as you is without expectations. Oh, I shall confound you all from one another. The strangest work of I come from a terrible place for crucibles of madness and rank contagion. I come with a terrible energy bursting into rooms like an engine's blast a foaming, shapeless gas. I infiltrate, incorporate, and float away unseen. Never has the seat run so deep Oh, I'll not go to thee, dog-like on love, but come straight to the point. The colonel and the carnage. To the edge! Triumph and disaster. Demon will not disappoint. The fiend can take direction and will, and I will have his threatening memoirs. Use them and hold them safe. That history I must have. Don't let lawyers be unbending swine. Even now, a demon diseased could rut a civil world with our unexpurgated history. I must not fail. He's well sworn. And before gabbling decline sets in, we'll dance brightly and hang like beef. Jack Kitch will silence ravens. And when Deming hangs, it is for me to honour his unprecedented grasp for immortality. For me! At my discretion. I have entered upon the strangest of careers with profit and pleasure, and by my art know a glimpse of what entertainment there can be. Your orders can scarcely cover the developments, gentlemen. I enjoy the time of my life consumed by art. Remarkable times, comrades. The case is an international sensation, and willful murder the success of the season. Four weeks, packed houses. But I still shudder to think that our leading man, Mr. Harper, was an unwitting intimate of the monster whilst the most successful professional engagement in South Africa. He saw no failing of himself, and was bitter and thwarted, often gay without, but seething bleak within. Mr. Harper, with unique intelligences, will be proud to render any assistance to the authorities. How beguiling is he who acts without the laws of God or man? We're quite bucking the economic trends uh, with dealing back from the desert, and now fell 
news of another wife and four precious infants slain. The hand that strikes thus strikes at the very heart of empire. Evil that gets them in, safe in their seats, frightened, fascinated, and overwhelmed with its myriad implications and manifestations. Fine old critics! I've heard Mr. Darwin's performance as Constable Coulterham described as well observed and not without merit. Some think they can learn of evil and triumph over it. <laughs> a dangerous defile, my friends, a treacherous trance from which few return unscathed. They must be it. <laughs> ah, good grief. Uh, business calls, gentlemen. Uh, pop up to the royal circle and have a drink. I love playing the villain. Playing like a fish, like an actor, like a villain. I love the play of villainy. Ted will look after you. How would it be, do you think, if I were ever cast to play the villain? A life of villainy. Acclaimed evil actor, Albert Arthur, in multiple evil outfits. <laughs> Richard III, Iago, and life after death for Damien. Oh, other refreshments as guests of the Dampier Company. Constant Congress with corruption. I could be but one more better than I among many. Ah, oh, it's an evil world out there, my boys. I need another pint. I see Molly in the crowd, in the crowd, in the crowd. I see Molly in the crowd, standing proud, standing proud. I see Molly in the crowd, all her lusts are now allowed. I would see her in a shroud, damn her eyes. Uh, I promised you something good in this one, Catherine. And this just might be it. Mm -hmm. yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Right, uh, you play Miss Catherine Roundsfell, an impressionable 18 year old, last employed as a station's assistant in Brisbane. I cannot play an 18 year old, Alfred. Don't be ridiculous. Oh, the age doesn't matter. Oh, does it not? <clears throat> now, briefly, and contrary to all reason, you became. You fell head over heels for the brute, mm, and he remains an ever of you. You were on your way to meet the monster when you heard the terrible news. Oh, you have seen the harrowing accounts of Dr. Springport's evidence, and reflecting on these horrors, alone in your room you are harrowed once again by the intimate touch of the fiend, his courtship and inclinations. Let's begin with violence and unspeakable perversion. His father, he says, was a godless brute steeped in violence and unspeakable perversion. He died in the Birkenhead madhouse after fathering many children, lying living and dead on the raving madmother. At the age of 11, Deeming went into the asylum. They called him Mad Fred, and they never you came. This is Melbourne Trail, old man. A very temple to corruption. People come and go. Addicted to women. He was addicted to their use. Money changes hands. It's like Collins Street in here. Not that I'd see a Sue. Sorry, a Sue. I wouldn't see one. Sue's is what oils the wheels round here. Crime, delusion, unspeakable squalor, unspeakable practices. Seizures, fits, an incomprehensibly plausible swindler, a diseased and unrepentant thief, a liar, a bigamist, a roué, an infanticide, a vulgar braggart, brutal killer. The ghost of his dead mother come to him, they say, and command him no more. Yet he claims to know nothing of it. He claims a man called Huey Hughes ran off with Emily Williams, and the Windsor corpse is none of her. I wish it could be more. You do me proud, for we are partners, brothers, parts to play, entrances and exits. A prophet is ever without honour in his own country. That can be so, often almost ever. Good news, Father. Our experiment proves ever more instructive. Monumental. Our work 
is an immaterial wonder of the world. I continue awed by your performance, Alfred. Awed. One day, the world will know. He claims a creature called Old Tom did for all the English there. The wife's mother, evil and sly, helped Old Tom slaughter the women, slash the throats of infants, and seal them in a brand new floor. None believe. Demons killed them all, and more for sure, and surely would have saved me. You are writing a memoir, it's what it was, not being creative. Indeed. I might get a woman in for exercise. Ah, but she'd be fleeting and not of the best sort. We mustn't trust the filthy harlots, Alfred. Cost a fiver, isn't it? Probably too. But we must take care your document does not reach the wrong hands. It must not be disseminated prematurely. In my own hand, our entire enterprise is exquisite and explicit detail. The solicitor will deliver the final draft, including the last night in the death cell, to you at the earliest opportunity. Don't worry, Arthur. I've timed it to a T. Impossible to know what he means by it. When you vanish away, the truth be trumpeted, Memoir can further astonish and be spread. Impossible to know. I cannot fault you. You are wholly persuasive. This intricacy excels. Be sure the document comes to me. And credit will accrue to you for this. Good. Any monies accruing to the memoir must go to the study. A capital scheme, but it is vital. You do not unmask my Alfred Hartford before he has, in fact, disappeared. The actor's nightmare must be seen. There is something in it for everyone. And then I disappear, and gladly, into the throng's obscurity. Mr. Deeming, you are an example to all. But I must, for both our sakes, move on. Your audience awaits. But I will make every effort. How much did it cost you to get this far? It's about 30 bob. 30 bob. True bonds cannot be broken. I am determined to return, my friend, before the curtain. Final night in the death cell. 
We should focus on that. That is the key. The final soliloquy. Patrons expect a full supporting cast, Mr. Harford. What is this speculation taking us, Mr. Harford? I have a dead cell saying. <laughs> uh, script! Come on, then. I'm sick of the sound of my own voice if you want to know the truth. Go on, Harford. Perhaps some good will come of it. Uh, I wonder if I might borrow it. This is dead. Oh, breakages must be paid for. Now, you are dead. A disapproving ghost. Stern, loveless, silent. My dead mother. Beanie's dead mother? Yes. You are dead mother. As mad as a hatter and quite beyond touch. How could you possibly understand? Well, what's that? How things move. Where, where, where once I saw insurmountable disadvantage, now I celebrate the very making of myself. Oh, such filth. And now it all points here. To me, the final death cell and the leading man, Frederick Bailey Deming. I like this mother ghost business. If only you knew what you expelled that day, mother. If only! Well, it's a naughty one, we don't know. Oh, shut up, Alfred. This is an <laughs> unexpected reading, Mr. Harford. These things must unfold. Evil must unfold. Yes, yes. Do you think he could have a, a fight with his dead mother, oh, do you think? I don't think so, Alfred. Patently absurd. Oh, quite right, quite right. Oh, could the ghosts of Lago's victims rise up and utterly destroy the brute, hmm? Probably not. It's the uh, husk of a man quite uh, shattered in mind that walks stiffly to his doom in Melbourne jail. Is that what you have in mind, old boy? No. Well, it's all serviceable, serviceable stuff, old boy. I'll give you that. But, um, you know, where are you heading? Scandinavian attitudes? I mean, where are you actually leading us? My life. Make one or two points. Oh, drive on points. What points did you have in mind? <laughs> Wilful murder has been running for a month now. Packed. A triumph. How long can such bounty provide? Another month. At least another month. Well, verdict in. Deeming won't be with us long. New abominations may come to light. The tally of South African frauds grows daily, but such will not sustain a production of this grandeur. Willful murder is on borrowed time. Any thoughts? When Dean and Willful murder are both dead, I want to continue your experiment, Alfred. One day, Willful murder will be seen as a beacon amongst English-speaking peoples and beyond. Where? Dean will soon be dead. We must weave the stuff of legend about him. Immortality of sorts. He will hang from the beam that broke Ned Kelly. We have a golden opportunity. I have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, old boy. A production. <laughs> a dream, both thrilling and chilling, that can employ us all and make use of my unique associations with the terrible man himself. The play is called The Actor's Nightmare. Drawn from personal experience? <laughs> we can make use of existing settings. And there are wonderful roles for you, but, oh, that's nice. Now, I, I am back in South Africa. Me, Alfred Hartford, actor, lost in the desert with Deming, who flees the sleepless hounds of scandal. Deming and I, lost in the desert together. A foolish actor and a monster of depravity. Now, Deming contrives an accident, a, a fall perhaps, and the actor is incapacitated and half demented with the pain and heat. The epitome of evil. Deeming works diabolically on the actor's impressionable mind and bends him entirely to his fathomless will. It was decided between Mr. Dampier and I that there would be no madness, Eric Doctors, no outlaw gangs, no black-faced minstrels, and no mad mesmeric doctors. Born in and of evil, suckled on it, nurtured on deceit and corruption, 
And? A theatre lover. Deeming weaves a fabulous flim flam. <laughs> Through ruthless manipulation of the pain, unexpected narcotics, specific specifics, impressionable mind, broken sanity, the actor comes to believe that for art, for the strangest notoriety, influence, devotion, and more, he can change places with his master. He can quite literally step into another's shoes, swap destinies, and take a new place in the world. You have to be bonkers. Exactly. In the strangest collaboration, this actor becomes the creature of a crazed criminal mastermind. Unscrupulous completely, he can play out another life and see it through to the very end. He would die for his art. <laughs> he will die for it! Die? They plot it and pervert it, deeming in the actor out there in the wastes of South Africa. And the actor undertook to play out the dreadful life of his manager, mentor, master, sage, saviour, friend, muse, and colleague, Frederick Bailey Deeming. An unprecedented artistic challenge and a madman. I don't think so. And I'm sorry, my dear, I see few openings for the lady. I like um, a marionette or a, a puppet or a sapient pig. The actor goes to the gallows pretending to be deeming one performance only. No, I'm, I'm, I'm unconvinced. Uh, no. The credulity's in tatters. It opens enormous theatrical possibilities. Why would this actor fellow want to go to the... Gallows clearly set and swap places with a man set for the scaffold. He's an artist. He's tortured. He's mad. So is his chum. But actors are hugely practical. What does he get out of this? <laughs> Immortality. Society thinks justice has been done. Nobody knows the truth. Well, that is where the actor's nightmare comes in. Let me get this clear. Lunatic changes places with craftier lunatic and dies for the sake of art. Strange things have happened, but I confess to concerns. What do you suppose happens to Deeming himself? Not the actor substitute swap, but the original mastermind who swapped. Well, there you have it. <laughs> people will assume. Well, people can assume as they say, like. <laughs> as long as they fill this ground. Well, obviously, they'll assume that the, uh, the actor playing evil genius deeming is, in actual fact, evil genius deeming. <laughs> That's ingenious, Harvard, I'll give you that. But it could attract louts, officials, bureaucrats, enemies of art. Well, it must be said, Mr. Harford, that you cynically associate yourself with a murderer and an infanticide. Lunatic, thief. Surely we want that, Mr. Harford. You have to be careful. Opportunity knocks, friends. I can do this. I am ambitious and resourceful. Scandal can be the making of a man. Not as often as a scandalous man might hope. I am the master of my fate. Captain of the soul, also, Mr. Harford. You need to flesh this out. More detail, more flesh, more shape. More flesh. Radical fantasia of yours could be seen by many as a crude exploitation. I can withstand that. Mm. Trust me, you need this down on paper. We could make the whole uneasy world shudder. It was tall. You have produced the germ of an idea. Now, when that germ reaches play proportions, we'll talk again, eh? A regime of murder, madness, and mystery is not for the faint of heart. I have a particular aversion to the sounds made when the trapdoor on our stage scaffold flings the monster to his doom. Thanks, all fair round. Business could not be busier. It is a beautiful and vivacious theatre, and I love to see her happy. Our ever ever-changing production concerns the celebrated murder of Frederick Bailey Deeming, who will be 
long hanged and forgotten by the time you read this. Alfred and I are exhausted but painfully aware how quickly fortunes turn. Even now we seek next season's sensation. Come. Uh, Mrs. Dad here. Uh, uh, Catherine. Catching up on correspondence long overdue. An idea. I, I had an idea. You're a fun, Mr. Harford. Very fun. This memoir Deeming is composing in the depths. I read in the sand and he's too shy short of 14 projected children. Madam, I confess I visited him. What? In disguise. One of many willing to stump up 30 bob to make the monster of the millennium. 30 bob? Oh, delighted to stump. Was he lucid? After a fashion. Good God. Oh, if people see me at my research, <laughs> the public has an appetite. Some would see these research as complicity with a devious, debauched, and deadly lunatic. It's a game. Not for deeming. Perhaps mostly for deeming. Play. You must have some reservations about this peculiar notoriety you see. Mrs. Dampier, I can get Deeming's death cell memoir. Negotiations are in train. I beg your pardon. A shattering document Deeming is working on, the unexpurgated testament of internationally acclaimed evil. I can get it. Alfred, I really wish you'd not had spoken to me about this. These villainies are such that would shake the stoutest soul, and, and they are the perfect foundation for the actors. Deeming may yet sustain more salutary fare. Your love of the classics and that of the governor is well known. Alfred, I am not particularly pleased with the way that this whole Deeming thing is going. Imagine some lunatic gets in his mind that we are in some way associating or supporting Deeming. Every person in this company, including yourself, could be subject to frenzied attack. Catherine, have you seen my thing? Oh, hello, Alfred. Gory Evans? Yes, here's gory evidence one minute, the next is true. Gory evidence on the props table, Alfred. Remember, we have spoken about this. Uh, gory evidence, props table, because you keep leaving it in places. <laughs> Quite right. Oh, what would I do without that woman, eh? Unstinting blessings on you, sweet. Get it all right, Harvard. We are talking about Deeming, the actor's nightmare, and we need to talk more. Are you all right, Captain? Uh, is there a problem? Oh, I have absolutely no idea. Is that a problem? Mrs. Dampier is right, so we, we should talk. Light. Deeming is about to be hanged, and we are engulfed in unpleasantness. Pardon. Pop up to the Royal Circle. Have a beer. Uh, Cosmo's bringing over you uh, death cell stuff. We must scavenge while we can. Thank you, sir, I will. Although, my enthusiasm for the death cell stuff is at an end. We can do better. There is meat more appropriate. It's one of the things we might talk about. McFadden Riddle! Mrs. Bootle, how goes it with Darmody? I need a pint of scout. <laughs> Your exceptional health. <laughs> Uncharted waters. <laughs> a nice clean fiber. On a sticky altar. A nice small thank you to the gods. I'm having a beautiful time, ladies and gentlemen, and I would be delighted if you would join me in toxicating times. There is nothing quite like theatre for engendering the basis of emotions, Alfred, mm -hmm. but do you not think we are losing sight of reality? <laughs> Success is definitely going to my head, Mrs. Bootle. Reality, Catherine. It must be said, Alfred, that Mr. Harford is as mad as a hatter. Yes, I, I had thought that. Mm -hmm. And who do you think is pulling deeming strings? And did you draw comfort from these thoughts? Well, I, I filed them, actually, more or less, pending further developments. Traces of fire, but he's not besmirched that far, Mr. Darmody. 
It's this actor's nightmare thing. It, it needs uh, posing. Oh, exactly. Down. Nowhere else. He just keeps writing the damn thing. And trying it out. Do you ever feel like you're drowning in a sink of abomination, Alfred? Abomination? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. Quite often. He has been the making of me. You're a monster, Deeming. The man in the street is livid. Can you not see the ghost of my dead mother? Damn you! Deadly hypocrite and bureaucrat! And this will help you now. You're a monster, a deformity of nature, a depraved being. Your brain is diseased. I'll say you to that, mother. <clears throat> Some think death is too good for you. Some, by the southern cross, would have you die publicly in appalling new ways. The man in the street is greatly aroused. There is no ghost. Society deserves protection from your sort. Harry them, Harry them, the enemy of Massey. The true turning point in my affairs came in England. Deb, mistress of the north. When we burst from wild South Africa, it was to England straight. Society cares nothing for your exotic tales. I was an actor, you see. I am an actor now, playing Frederick Bailey Deeming. You're a nutter. I die at dawn. And we'll say this once, this last night. Only you will hear, and none will believe. How piquant is that? I am an actor called Alfred Hartland, and I shall play Frederick Bailey Deeming to the death. If this is the best that you can do, I shall cut this distasteful guilty short. My life is a work of art! If your life is a work of art, tell me, what have you done with this, this memoir to shape the world? It is safe. Where? We monsters have our rights, you know. This memoir will pass. You will be dead. My memoir. It's extravagantly sensational! We'll never see a moment of peace. Fancy saying that. I seek no peace, Mother. I burnish the legend of Mad Fred Deeming. No, Deeming's death cell is not our final destination. I look to atrocities in England's north. A wife and mother slaughtered with four blameless children. Just how bonkers is he, Kate? I mean, this is a tricky game. <laughs> Timing is crucial. We have creative people on hand. Art and life. Volatile mix always has me. But, I mean, he is uh, peculiar and works hard with this um, actor's nightmare extravaganza. He does resonate. I mean, he has ideas of just how bonkers is he? That is the question. I mean, but in a company, we can make allowances. But can he function beyond without unpleasantness? Deeming was different when he returned to England from South Africa. Reborn. Things had happened. This is where the awful legend really takes flight. Denham Villa, Rainhill, Lancashire. I await important documents on that. I can't say too much. Oh, me name is Samuel. It's Samuel, it's Samuel. Me name is Samuel. Damn your eyes and blast your souls. Oh, me name is Samuel. And I know the truth to tell. I will see you all in hell. Damn your eyes and blast your souls to bloody hell. Deeming is dead. The creature so named is hanged. Deeming is dead, gentlemen, and the life expectancy of willful murder much diminished. Ooh. A few days, Mrs. Dampier, and the actor's nightmare will be in your hands. Hourly, I await information, corroboration, inspiration. Deeming memoirs? Those guarded yet unguarded papers are an asset of incalculable value to any production of the actor's nightmare. Okay, little Alfred. Four chairs with a bound. 
deeming memoirs will little the streets like Irish from Perry's day. You haven't committed an actual money to this acquisition. A few pounds from my own pocket? Oh, it could be worse. We need a script, gentlemen. This is unexplored territory. I, I, I do understand your concerns. Do you really? It is the suggestion that I am not Alfred Hartford, actor, but deeming the demon. That I manipulate innocents to their deaths and scorn all right-thinking members of society. That, having driven my dullard confederate mad, he fades into the fabric of the right and true history of Frederick Bailey Deming. I thrive as Alfred Harford, and he dies in my place. Well, Mr. Deeming should get a better manager. Mm. And here's the bit of twist. I decide when, or even if, this right and true history is released to sensation seekers everywhere. The timing of this release is in my hands. Alfred Harford's hands. My hands. Did I? Didn't I? How much, if any, is true? Watch closely. If the truth is of a certain kind, I might simply match. Gentlemen, it must be said that this is dubious. Some would say very dubious. This is not art at all. No, I think you're taking this a touch. Seriously, my colleagues? Where I come from, this would be dubious. You are, you are right, Mr. Dampier, but perhaps we are all taking this far too seriously. I am worst. May a maxima culpa. I eat, sleep, and breathe theming. It's like a double act. Between the living and the dead. But perhaps a touch of frivolity for us all. That's the answer, and never a thought for the discuss. I don't think uh, frivolity is to be had. I don't think thrifts are thriving. Catherine, mm -hmm. your concern really does you great credit. But I can easily live out another year or two with a maelstrom of gossip and notoriety. I thrive. I can, I can see this through. I, I can act and act again. And, Stay the course and fulfill the unique demands of my role, inside and out. Fortunes can be made. Let us all profit. When we look back on these events from decrepitude through flutes and finest champagne, this will all seem silly, quaint, and old fashioned. What will actually stop this stone dead is that it's unspeakably tasteless. This. Make no decision until you've seen more of the script. Come, Catherine, we're going to lunch. All three. Oh, I shall have good beer and good pie. You, Catherine, must pander to your culinary limbs as you see fit. <laughs> you too, Arthur. Look, I think I should give uh, Raymond Cotterzer a better. Hmm? That's not dear. Bye bye. Up to the culture room. Global 
What fools! You are the very most of your deceit. How far can this go, Frederick? How far? Frederick, I cannot kill that woman. Consider a greater architecture of thought. Within that, you can do no wrong. I know. I know, but does she offer much to brutal murder? I don't think so. That's an issue. Part of one. She must die. Frederick, I am new to murder. It's a significant undertaking, even for a troubled actor. Here comes one. I must away, or we are uncovered and unentertained. A seminal 
moment. Awful matters. All in all, I'm rather humble. They'll say it was me, but I'm not a husband. I scarce know the lady. But I will hang for her ere long, whilst her husband and killer is known as me, enacting me on the long. There is meat enough in a turd for a thousand academics, and further meat for an actor, perhaps. When it is known what horrors we have done, what labyrinthine infamies we have wrought, and I get to, ri to write in touring the friendly colonies, oh, who could resist? I'd like to write. Actors often do. The day will come when I will write a memoir to shake the world. Perhaps a play called Demon. Now it's better to kill the children now before they become a burden. And one imagines them becoming a burden when one is bound for Botley Bay, bent on great mischief and mayhem. Oh, we cannot turn back. We are caught in a great tide of wickedness. A heavy thing indeed. Embrace! Horror with joy! Ah! Enough! I had to put an end to it right there. The whole business was preposterous. I couldn't give tickets away. To this day, I have absolutely no idea what Harford was aiming at. Oh, the little I saw was uninspiring, often in the worst possible taste. Indicative, Rangham said, of a, a, a decadence and a jaundiced frame of mind. Deeming was dead, and poor old willful murder was doomed. We did all right for a while, and I'm suitably pleased. Oh, dear, oh dear. There was a surprisingly little rancor when we declined to present willful murder. Harford bottled up his arm to present and did, didn't bother hawking it anywhere else. All in all, I think I did rather well out of life. I died on the 23rd of May, 1908, of a cerebral hemorrhage. Deeming became fog that thrilled and frightened those who knew him. He could be all men and had no goodness in him. He relished his atrocities, and I did not grieve that he died for them. Here, here. I, on the other hand, died in the United States of America on the 8th of March, 1915. And I was survived by two daughters. Harford never gave any indication, yea or nay, that a copy of the murderer's memoirs in fact passed to him. Oh, bogus memoirs enjoyed a vogue for a while, and poor old willful murder slept in, slept into obscurity, of course. The actor's nightmare. Ah, Harford did know Deeming in South Africa. How well, we will never know. Deeming was one to be reckoned with. Our fiend enjoyed a life in the theatre and made a go of it. He died in 1921. Yes, willful murder is uh, brought out, given a run every now and then. It's, it's part of being dead, you know. Damned bureaucracy. Anyway, willful murder gets a ghostly air, and I've no idea why. We've long since stopped learning from sterile repetition. The class of immortality, I suppose. Well, the shattering memoir was really not. Shattered nothing. The document was smothered up by government hands, unpublished, swallowed up, unseen save by faceless guardians of the common meal. The memoir vanished. Our ghostly mummings vary somewhat, but we have it down to about two hours of an interval. Pretty much runs like clockwork. Bloody hell. Bloody hell. 